Uh, today's session is focused on our legal vital. My name is Daniel Anzueto. I'm happy to welcome you to today's session. Uh, if this is your first time attending one of our workshops, let me provide some context on Startout. Startout accelerates the growth of the LGBTQ community to drive our economic empowerment, building a world where every LGBTQ plus entrepreneur has equal access to lead, succeed, and shape the workforce of the future. I'm excited to introduce our host for today, Victor Gonzalez Galliano, who will introduce our moderator as well. Uh, Victor, the floor is yours. Hey, bring it on. Thank you, Daniel, and good afternoon, everyone. And Maverick, thank you for joining us. If you wonder why I still have this up, it's just as a reminder that it's not just a celebration for the month of June. The celebration continues 365 days of the year. So thank you again for being here. Um, let me go ahead and share our screen. And here we go. All right, Maverick, you see my screen? Yes, we're good, fantabulous. So in partnership with a personal mobility coaching center, we're here because um, you got excited to hear about uh, the legal vital, um, like Daniel mentioned, part three of our five vital um, for entrepreneurs. Um, we started with, um, well being followed by financial, and now we get the opportunity to learn about uh, what legal plays in our solopreneur and entrepreneur business. Think of this as a classroom where all of you are uh, welcome in, in a trust and positive reinforcement in goal oriented environment, rules of engagement your rules, ask a lot of questions. Um, you, can o you can always utilize the, the chat and um, we can address the questions as we go and we'll give you some, some time at the end of the presentation so you can um, address questions that are particularly important to you, okay? Um, I'll start by saying muchas gracias for being courageous, being open, being present, be vulnerable, and most importantly, for being you. And um, so let's just break the ice, all right? All of us had memorable moments during Pride Month last month. So if you want to put it on the chat as we go, what was the most memorable moment? And Maverick, that goes for you too, and Daniel, you as well. We all get to play um, how we celebrated our Pride Month last month. So share with everybody. And why are we doing this? We're doing this because um, we want to learn, um, bring more to you as it relates to uh, maximizing on performance, productivity, and profitability for your business. So there's, there are five vitals to each business. Today's happens to be on what should we be paying attention to when it comes to legal matters. And although you may be familiar with this, you may not. So if you're already familiar with this, awesome. If you're not, um, pay attention. It's my gift. A to the fifth power. A1 for awareness, A2 for awakening, A3 for attitude, A4 for action, and A5 for accountability. So we're creating greater awareness as it relates to legal matters for your business today. But perhaps there's an awakening on something that you did not know. And an attitude must be changed in order for you to take action to get things corrected in a way that you can hold yourself accountable. That's sort of like the roadmap that I take when it comes to we are in a dark place when we are um, being brought to a place of enlightenment like Maverick is doing for us today by enlightening us with his intellectual capital when it comes to legal matters in our business. All of this being um, part of our program at the Personal Mobility Coaching Center. So I'm gonna stop here for a second, and then I'm gonna check out and see what was your most memorable moments. All right, get on everybody. Let me see. Oh, 
Let me see. I know that you just moved to Kansas. I got to walk in the bright rail. Oh, it's awesome. I spent it in the USA. Went to Boston for Pride <laughs> celebrations. Left Florida where I am. And I'm not joking when I said I spend it in the USA. Sometimes Florida does not feel like the United States of America. Some of you might know this. Uh, Maric laughs. So uh, let me go back to this and make sure you guys are seeing my presentation. I did something. So hang in there, kiddo. I'm going back to this. Technology is great when it works and when we know how to use it. The Maverick, tell me that you're seeing yourself. All right. So Maverick is a lawyer out of New York. He's the founder and managing attorney at Avant Guardi Legal, um, specializing in innovative solutions with data protection built in. Maverick leads his practice by focusing on comprehensive data privacy laws and regulations. And I am so excited to have you as part of our uh, team for helping us understand what are some of the things that we should uh, focus on when it comes to um, legal matters for our businesses. So Maverick, the floor is all yours. Bring it on. Sure, thank you so much, Victor, for that intro. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or I guess maybe uh, almost afternoon for some folks. I know everyone is coming in from different places, but um, thank you so much for coming to the uh, legal vital component of the Business Health Navigator program. My name is Maverick James, and I'm really excited to kind of guide you through the essential legal basics that every startup founder should know. You know, um, a little bit about me, I am an attorney based, licensed and based in New York City. I'm also um, a certified information privacy professional and manager. Um, and really what that means is that I've got a little bit of a specialization when it comes to data. And I think when we think about startups and we think about um, the startup world today, a lot of it is rooted in technology and, and in that in itself is data, right? Um, so I really make sure that we kind of understand the basics. There are basics to the legal component of running a, a startup and a small business, but as the we evolve and the technology rapidly changes for startups and small businesses, I always want to keep in mind looking forward as well. Um, so before we begin, we begin, I wanted to just emphasize that you know, this presentation is designed to provide a gen to provide general information and should not be considered as legal advice, you know, as um, laws and regulations can vary significantly across different jurisdictions. So it's crucial to consult with a qualified legal professional especially in your area for your specific guidance related to your business. So again, this is just a disclaimer that all lawyers have to kind of give at the beginning of just knowing that this isn't legal advice, but um, it's general information that'll help you within the understanding the legal basics for um, your business. And, you know, um, and I'm sure we have some questions for the end, but yeah, just to go through the agenda a little bit, we're just going to talk about uh, we're going to start with understanding the right business structure for startups and um, businesses, meaning what type of business structure do you want to have when you start your business? Um, what's, which one makes sense um, for you financially, fiscally, um, all of those things. But also, what are the legalities when it comes to choosing a structure? Um, we're going to understand go through understanding intellectual property, especially when it comes to starting um especially companies today and understanding where you want to take your company. A lot of it is building your ideas, right? So how do we understand um, the idea of protecting those intangible ideas? And as everyone knows, we want to talk about contracts, um, 
contracts is something that when you think of legal, you probably think of contracts, right? Um, and it's something really important, especially for um, startups to really think about from the beginning, because we want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves as we build up, we scale, we make ourselves more known into the um, infrastructure. Then we've got a few other basics, like employment law basics for when you first hire that person that's going to help you scale your business and understanding regulatory compliance, which types of, what type of compliance do you need to do? We put compliance in this pretty broad ter term, but what drives that compliance? Who drives that compliance, right? Like what regulatory bodies drive those compliance requirements? Um, funding, funding is always a big thing for startups, right? Um, and small businesses too. Whenever you want to scale, how do you look at funding? What are you doing right now? And what do you need to think about um, from a legal aspect? Um, and then risk management and insurance, um, understanding, you know, there's very big, there's two big ways to mitigate risk. There's contracts, and then there's things like insurance as well um, that can help you mitigate the risk that um, comes with different, uh, choosing different strategies, ideas when leading your business. Um, and then last but not least, and something, you know, sometimes we don't want to think about, but uh, as the lawyer in the room and something, you know, we've got to push through as well. And just something to know from like a uh, building your foundation uh, set up for your business. What are your exit strategies? What does it look like if your business is not going the way you want to go to and you need like a plan B, right? These are hard questions. We nobody really wants to think about them, especially when you're starting up. But in my experience, representing different startups, representing different companies, especially within the small range who are looking to scale, having that understanding at the very least that there is a backup, there are some things that can help you to when things go wrong or some things when um, there are avenues that you can take to go to um, kind of escape the um, specific decisions that didn't go, didn't pan out the way you wanted to at least having the knowledge of them is really, really important. Um, and then we'll kind of conclude there and then go through a Q&A session. Um, so with that, let's go to the first, I think the first slide is, it's more of my introduction actually. Um, I, I'm really excited to be a part of this and you know, um, really thank Start Out for having me come through and um, talk about this because I think it also shows that, you know, um, especially with this business health navigator program, we're really understanding that legal is not just something you take on as problems or conflicts arise, but something that you need to have from the get go so that it supports you in building your foundation to build your business. And that's such a great message. And hopefully it's one that, you know, you take, if there's anything that you take, you take from this presentation, I hope it's that for sure. All right, so let's go to the first one, um, our first slide, and just talking about the different business structures. So one of the first legal decisions that you'll make as an entrepreneur is choosing the right business structure, right? Um, and there are several options, each with its own advantages and considerations. The first one, first structure that we have is the sole proprietorship. This is the simplest form of business where you and your business are considered the same legal entity, and it's easy to set up, but offers virtually no um, personal per, uh, liability protection. So basically, if you are running your business, you're just selling it yourself, you don't have a registered entity for your business, um, you and your business are one. And so you'll be treated that way when it comes to liability considerations, when it comes to tax purposes, a whole bunch of things, right? And that's something that most folks are, some people are comfortable with and might make sense for your specific business um, venture. But for the majority part, a lot of folks decide to create a separate entity for their businesses. The next one um, is kind of one step up from the sole proprietorship, and it's a partnership. Um, it's similar to the sole proprietorship, but for two or more people. It can be general or limited partnerships. Um, one example, I'm sure you've seen actually law firms. Law firms really operate a lot through partnerships. And you'll probably see, you know, like, some name, some name, some name, LLP, right? And that is actually, um, the LLP is the structure that designates this law firm as a partnership. And you have both general partners and limited partners. General partners means that you have more of 
a stake in the company as well as you take on more of the liability versus the limited partners in the partnership who have less of a stake in the company but have limited liability within the company, right? Um, but what's more popular, especially from a startup foundation, it's the LLC. And that stands for the Limited Liability Corporation. And it the structure combines the liability protection of a corporation, but with the tax benefits and flexibility of a partnership. The so these just think, you know, this is kind of combination of what we'll talk about next, which is a corporation, which is one thing that you understand from um, just understanding businesses, right? Um, and you, it, 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 there's a question there. Uh, we'll address that, yeah. Um, so from the LLC standpoint, you know, this is where you can kind of um, take yourself away from, you can help to build that separate entity to protect yourself from uh, liabilities so that your company operates as its own um, entity, but it still has some of the benefits that you would get from being in a partnership, right? Where you create uh, different, there are two separate ways to create an LLC. You can have a member managed LLC where you have your members or your partners agree to um, uh, uh, agree within an, um, an operating agreement and go through and decide to be part of this, this LLC to that. Um, and then last we have our corporation, right? This is your general corporation that you see um, usually used at the end of a company's name. You'll see it have INC, um, INC at the end, or you'll have, they're usually corporations don't, some, some jurisdictions don't need to have the INC at the end to designate it as a corporation. Um, Corporations are really the biggest way to keep you, yourself, and your legal entities separate. Um, and there are two main types of corporations. There's the, what we, uh, what you'll want to really focus on. It's the C corporations and S corporations. Now, C corporation is really what your entity is going to be, but S corporation is a designation for tax purposes. Um, and so when you register, depending on your jurisdiction and depending on the rules in your state, you're able to register as both as a C corporation, but for tax purposes, as an S corporation. Some jurisdictions like in New York actually require you to um, be registered as a C corporation and only file taxes in as an S corporation. Other jurisdictions might think differently. Um, and so, you know, when choosing your business structure, you want to consider factors like liability protection, tax implications, flexibility, and future growth plans. And remember that the best choice can vary depending on your specific circumstances and your local laws. But once you've decided on a good structure, the main thing is registering that business. There are so many clients that I've had who have decided, yeah, I want to have a separate entity for my um, business so that I can generate revenue through that and I can keep my personal assets safe. But the real um, damage that I've seen is when people don't um, call on lawyers and uh, uh, what's it called, take get a lawyer's take, understand what the proper registration requirements are in their jurisdiction and then properly file um your business or properly register your business with the Secretary of State. It's a bit of an arduous process, but it's one that you don't want to take lightly because it can have a lot of ramifications if you don't register it properly um, from a tax purpose, from a liability purpose. Um, and so it's something that's why we start with choosing the right business structure, but understanding how to properly file them. I had a client once who we uh, who had filed properly with the Secretary of State did everything right, thought they were doing everything, well, thought they were doing everything right. Um, and they were part of an LLC uh, management. But in New York, at least, um, we have a requirement where we need to publish our, you need to publish that your entity exists within a public newspaper for at least 60 days, 60 or 30 days, I forget exactly the, the ideas. But just the idea that you have to publish something in order to validate your registration um, with the Secretary of State is something that's easily forgettable, right? It's not something that's intuitive. And sometimes you don't have the, you know, the government entities and government bodies don't have all the information for you. 
Um, so we really want to make sure that you focus on understanding the right requirements for registering your business once you've decided what works for you. Right, let's move on to the next one. All right, intellectual property. So protecting your intellectual property is crucial for startups, especially in today's rapidly evolving technology, technological landscape. And there are four main types of um, IP protection I wanna let you guys know about. There's trademarks. These protect your brand identities, like your business name, your logo, and your slogan. The thing that gets folks in the door to your business or to your website, that um, idea, that look, that brand, like that is what's driving them, driving folk, driving consumers to your business, right? Um, copyrights, these cover original works of authorship, including um, software code. If you're a developer, if you're, if you're um, in the tech startup world, you know, um, copyrights can also, you can also be, in, depending on the jurisdiction, you can also copyright software code. But it also includes marketing materials, it includes artistic works, you know, things that you create for your business. Um, the next one is a little bit more um, technical, but patents. These protect inventions and new technology. Some of you are startup owners that probably created a business based on an invention, right? Um, not protecting that, especially through a patent, can have serious ramifications for you, considering someone can find, uh, if someone sees that you're already publicly marketing something, your invention, someone can just copy that, file their own patent, and they now own the rights to that invention, right? So it's very, very important to do that. And our last one is trade secrets. So this covers confidential business information, which gives you that competitive edge, right? Um, it's a little tough to, uh, the idea of trade secrets um, has been heavily debated. It's, there's a lot of ways where you can say, yes, this falls under trade secrets, this doesn't, because you know, what constitutes general business information versus something that's unique to your company? These are uh, questions that the IP world, IP lawyers are constantly um, fighting about and constantly helping you understand that this should be protected as a trade secret. And I want to give you an example that's re recently in the news right now. Um, Starbucks is actually, you all know Starbucks, right? Um, and the iconic, um, I think it's like little like a mermaid statue like a mermaid with like a green within the green and black and white um, logo so they are suing another company called star buds star buds is actually a cannabis company and they grow cannabis um flower they grow cannabis they sell it and they happen to choose the name star buds they happen to choose a logo that looks eerily similar to the Starbucks logo with the same, uh, you know, mermaid-like figure, green, black, white um, figure with the circle and everything. Um, Starbucks did not do a good job by um, taking the time to look through and understand whether if they choose this as their logo, are they falling, uh, follow, falling under any type of trademark issues, any type of copyright issues? Um, and they decided to kind of just go ahead with it. And now going back, and they've been a very successful business for a couple of years now. Um, they're doing pretty well, but knock on the door here, Starbucks comes and says, this is basically our trademark. This is our logo. You cannot be using this logo for your company, right? Because they own the rights to it. So the idea is not that trademarks, trademarking your brand is you know, protecting you um, from when it happens, right? Starbuds is now being, is falling under, um, is in a lot of heat right now, not because they made a mistake and they decided to um, copy Starbucks, but because the ramifications of their business model is now at issue. Because if they cannot use their Starbuds logo, which is what something that they their entire brand is based on, what their consumers know, they're going to lose a lot of their business. So it's something that could have been prevented if they took the time to go through and secure their IP in the beginning. Um, so yeah, they're going to be in litigation with Starbucks. It's going to be costly. But the bigger cost is, are they going to be able to keep selling under that brand? Are people going to recognize them? Are people going to still come back to them after all of this? If they change up completely, all the customer base that they created, are they going to lose that? Right. So that's really where the issue comes and why we 
um, generally always, that's why a lot of us startup lawyers are also really pushing for um, having you, having startup founders and small businesses, put an emphasis on your intangibles. Those are important from the beginning, not later, um, because they're a really good reason why you do succeed, right? Um, now, uh, one quick thing I want to uh, quickly go back to um, for intellectual property, and something that's really coming up nowadays is the use of intellectual property and the combination with AI. I'm sure all of us know AI. Maybe there are some startup founders that are actually in the AI development phase who are creating their own AI technology. AI has been on the minds of everyone. And within the IP space, it's also a really important um, question, battle, whatever you want to call it, that's coming up. So AI generated works. If you're thinking of creating models, if you're thinking of creating di um, different intangibles with the use of AI, just things to know that the question of whether an AI generated content can be copyrighted is a really, really hot topic right now. And currently many jurisdictions require a human, require like a human to be part of that generation for copyright protection. So this means that works that are entirely created by AI might not be eligible for that copyright protection in some places. Um, and it's still something that's being heavily debated now, like right in front of our eyes. So it's so um, I wanted to throw out something there because I know people are using AI themselves. They're using AI tools, ChatGPT. Um, when it comes to your intangibles, keep an eye out for um, um, and reach out to an attorney as well to talk about whether your intangibles that are created with AI, do those count as something that you can secure? right? Especially if your business model is heavily dependent on them. Um, all right, now we can move to the next one. Slide. All right. Um, so the backbone of basically um, your legal foundation um, is going to be the contract. It's going to be the agreements. Um, as an attorney, I can say, yes, I love contracts and I love agreements, uh, but it's something that, you know, we want to make sure um, you all understand as well as you start up your businesses. Um, key contracts for startups can include, you know, a founder's agreement. Um, it outlines the relationships and responsibilities among co-founders, especially if you have a co-founder, um, or if, you know, you want to think about just those original, those first agreements in the beginning. Um, when you're deciding to be a co a, be in a co-founder agreement, but also when you decide to bring on more people. Uh, when you decide to bring on more people, you want to make sure that your foundation is set the way that you want it to be set. But you want to work with an attorney um, to develop that agreement. Um, employment agreements, when you're going to start to bring in more people to help you scale, help you understand how to move farther, things like that, you want to make sure that... Um, your employment agreements are good and they comply with labor laws and they work well within your jurisdiction, right? Um, to both protect yourself and to protect your company, um, you wanna make sure these agreements are good. Um, for the startup space, NDAs are something I'm sure everyone has heard of. You know, how do we wanna make sure, we wanna talk to people to start building our product, to start scaling our business, but we wanna make sure that what we're saying is gonna be protected. Um, from employees, from vendors, from partners, from potential customers, whoever. So we create these what are called non-disclosure agreements, and these protect your confidential information when you're sharing it with other people. Um, client customer contracts, right? These set the terms for your products or your services. Um, when you're drafting or reviewing contract, uh, you know, these are client customer contracts. They're set, they're the contracts that you create with clients are really, you know, I want to also separate some of you are startups and businesses that are B2B, where you'll probably have more of a, a formal contract-to-contract uh, -contract relationship, whereas some of you are B2C, right? Like you're going direct to consumers. You're not always going to create contracts for each of your individual um, uh, consumers or each individual customer that you have, right? But where we see, so that's where I want to kind of talk about when it comes to contract creations, it's not just going to be a scenario where you have, this is a contract that I've drafted with an attorney. It has a bunch of legalese on it. Um, I've signed it. 
you're, you've signed it as well. There we go. We've got a contract. Understand that contracts come in um, a variety of spaces. So take your website, for example. At this point, you know, uh, in this day and age, it's very hard to have a business and not have a website on it. If you are, let's say, a retail company and you sell products through your website, I'm sure a lot of you have seen some uh, websites that have terms of use on it or privacy policies on it or different other policies that are linked way at the bottom. Those are essentially contracts, right? Think of those as your contracts as well. In order for people to use your website or to access their we your website, you want to make sure that the users uh, or the consumers that are on your website are abiding by certain requirements that you have listed in your terms of use, in your privacy policy, or you know, in uh, in other di um, digital uh, website notices that you want to make sure that consumers know that these are things they can do and these are things they can't do. So contracts are not just something that you you know sit down and um, create via B two B or anything like that. It's also something that is um, created when you are offering something to the world, right? And so if you can think about contracts that way, it becomes a lot um, easier to see that um, building relationships aren't just, you know, like let's create a formal contract. Building relationship just means what am I offering you? What are you um, uh, doing to uh, accept that offer? And then what's the consideration? Meaning like what's the... Um, benefit that you're receiving out of this or both of us that we're receiving out of it, right? But when you're drafting or reviewing contracts, you wanna pay attention to the clearly defined terms and obligations. You wanna look at the payment terms and conditions, just some things that to look at for um, contracts in general. Um, intellectual property ownership, some contracts will um, denote those early on as well. Termination clauses, those are really important. A lot of termination clauses are varied for sure, and some of them require you to do things before you're able to terminate, like give written notice to um, the counterparty, right? Um, you'll have 60 days in order to provide that notice and then the contract will be terminated. So different things like that. Um, and then dispute resolution procedures, right? Sometimes um, contract law is very, um, it's what we call all encompassing where you can definitely take it to court, but contract law is something that is um, seen in all aspects of dispute resolution. So are you putting in terms where if you have a dispute with the your contract, with your co-party on the contract or your counterparty on the contract, are you going to take this straight to court? Are you going to allow for that? Are you going to say, no, let's try to resolve it in a mediation or a dispute resolution like arbitration that is less costly um, than court? And these things are not something, these are, all of these clauses, again, are things that you want to talk to a lawyer about because you don't necessarily need to have them in order to develop a proper relationship. But depending on the type of agreement, depending on the risk associated, depending on the um, company that you have, the, the IP, all of that, all of that is taken into consideration just on the idea of, do we need to have a separate dispute resolution clause? Do we need to term, uh, do we need to have a termination clause that's X date or that date, right? So it's always important to work with a lawyer to um, make sure that your contracts are keyed up to protect yourself, to protect your company, um, in the right way and from the, from early on as well. Um, and then I guess the other thing is just uh, real quick for contracts, you know, as I'm also a lawyer here, right? So I understand that the tendency for lawyers to go through or, or to see contracts is to go through and see, put in a lot of legalese, right? Like they put in a lot of words like here under and therefore to and here to for. That's not necessarily the best thing. And that's also not um, usually, you know, it's a practice that lawyers themselves are also um, veering away from because we wanna aim for clarity in your contracts and to prevent misunderstandings because that is how you're gonna protect, you're gonna prevent um, those potential disputes down the line. All of that can be done while being super clear and also protecting yourself too. So just some things to just something to keep in mind as well. All right, let's move on to the next slide. 
Thank you. So the next thing where I wanted to go through are the employment law basics. And why do we talk about employment law this early on in the game? Maybe you're a founder and you're just working on yourself. And that's totally, um, you know, you might not might think, well, I don't need to know about employment law, right? I'm, I'm, I'm the company owner. I can't hire myself. It's um, not really relevant to me. But people don't, but you all and also folks don't go into business and create their startups to kind of be on their own, right? You're always, you're at some point or the other, you're going to think about bringing on people to help you, to help you build something to um, enhance your business model, to help you expand, to help you scale. And when you bring other people into your business, that is where employment law automatically triggers. And you have to understand the basics behind that. Um, and so, you know, things that you want to look out for are or understand at least, especially within your jurisdiction. Employment law is a federal practice for sure, but it's also all states have their own niches and nuances when it comes to employment law. Um, Anti-discrimination laws, your jurisdiction might have these laws um, with that prohibit discrimination based on protected characteristics like race, gender, age, disability, um, sexual orientation, and in many jurisdictions, um, it's uh, these same fat, these same um, uh, ident- uh, protected characteristics may not be available for uh, within the anti discrimination laws. So you have to understand what's specific to and what's unique about your jurisdiction. Um, employee classification: correctly classifying workers as employees, which fall under the W two standard, or independent contractors is increasingly becoming more and more important. Uh, Misclassification can lead to severe penalties if you are ever to be investigated um, in the sense of you've been treating an employee as a 1099 employee where they're independent contractor and realizing that if you're treating them as a 1099, you're not giving them the specific rights that a W-2 employee would have in your jurisdiction not knowing that from the beginning and an employee coming back and saying, well, I used, I basically worked this way. That looks like I worked as a W-2 employee. Um, It can be very, very impactful, especially if the EEOC, the um, uh, different regulatory bodies come back and say, you know, we need to launch an investigation and understand why you were not correctly um, paying this person as a W-2 or why were you not providing the the specific rights that um, this individual needed. Um, So it's really important to understand, you know, how you're classifying your um, employees. And just because you may contract and say, I'm hiring you as a 1099, if you're treating them, if you're giving them work, if they are working like a W-2, in some jurisdictions, most courts will just say, sorry, that's a W-2 employee. That's not a 1099 employee, even though your contract says differently, right? So it's something, it's also something that you want to just be mindful of, especially in your specific jurisdiction. Um, Wage and hour laws, understand the minimum wage requirements, overtime rules, meal and rest break regulations in your jurisdiction. Just because we're remote, um, it's uh, definitely caused a lot of, um, chaos, I guess, for uh, lack of better terms, for because these types of monitoring is a little bit easier when it's when everyone's in kind of the same office. But with more remote work coming through, with more people working from home, um, the idea of you know having uh, these rules kind of coming into play um, are not really going back in the. They're not going to the back burner. Uh, regulators are still looking at these um, laws and making sure that you're following them. They're just seeing how you're doing it in a different way, you know? So that's something to also just keep in mind as well. Um, Speaking of remote work, workplace privacy, you need to develop clear policies on employee privacy, especially regarding your data collection and monitoring. If you are um, a business that is gonna monitor your employees, it's something you need to disclose right from the beginning, right? Like there are a number of monitoring softwares out there. Employers use you as a business owner are gonna think maybe I wanna use some type of software like that. 
keep an eye out just to understand what those clear policies would be would look like for you and make sure that it's um, uh, said to your um, employees um, from the beginning. Um, worker displacement and just train and retraining. Um, so, well, this is more of kind of like an AI uh, task on it. When you take on new folks now, so I think the since this is more of like a startup world, this doesn't super apply. But if this is if you're like a small business, you've already been in practice for a while, and you are you have employees, but you're thinking of replacing them with or replacing some tasks with AI um, specific AI tools. Um, keep an eye out for you know how your jurisdiction handles that because it's something that's coming up now as well as um, a serious issue that most companies are kind of getting under scrutiny about. Um, and consider your obligations when it comes to the worker displacement and opportunities for retraining or things like that. Um, and then health and safety. Employers have a duty to provide a safe working environment. And that means both um, on the premises, if you have a physical location, as well as online, right? So. What does health and safety look like online is very different from um, in person, but we need to consider both aspects, right? Um, and then work, just general workplace policies. You wanna make sure that you've developed clear policies on issues like harassment, time off, um, and you know now AI as uh, it comes into play. You know, what are the AI, how are your employees allowed to use AI, right? Those actually fall under the workplace policy and handbook um, scenario. We want to make sure that um, you set the clear expectations from the beginning. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. All right, so this is kind of our most fun one, right? Regulatory compliance. I think we all know that um, we're required to co comply with so many different laws. And I've probably given you you know, a whole bunch of uh, information already. Well, and um, that's not even including all of the specific laws out there that your company might be subject to. Now, regulatory compliance is something that's super broad and it varies significantly by industry and location, but there are some areas that are common to all businesses, right? So, um, you know, uh, like, so for one I've listed is data privacy and protection. Um, the reason why I put in data privacy and protection is we're living in a world right now where if you're running a business, there's no way that you don't have some type of digital presence. There's no way that your um, company isn't trying to collect data or doing something with data, right? Um, and the reason why we as businesses need to focus on data protection laws specifically now is because data protection laws and data privacy laws, they don't rely on whether your in that jurisdiction to be subject to that law. So for example, if you were, um, so I have here um, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. This is the main data protection regulation in the EU, in the European Union. So you might think, well, I'm in the US, why is that going to um, affect me? That, why should it affect me at all? But that's the whole point of these data privacy laws. They have their scope is actually applicable to any company that does business in the EU, regardless of whether they are physically located in the EU. And that's kind of the scope for all data privacy laws. We have in the US, we don't have a full um, federal law that um, all companies are required to follow, but we're following this pattern where every state is looking to enact their own state comprehensive privacy law. So right now, I think we're at about 12 states that have a comprehensive privacy law that says if you do business in this state, if you collect the data of residents in this state um, and you meet certain thresholds, you're going to be subject to this state's data privacy law, regardless of whether you're actually physically in that state. So it's something that I want everyone to, to really uh, um, think about um, because it's just so unavoidable now. And the way that we see it, uh, there could be, depending on your business model, depending on your structure, it's completely possible to be subject to multiple data privacy laws across the world, 
um, just sitting in your specific location, right? Um, and it all depends on your type of business and um, technology that you use and the rapidly evolving technology that you're most likely going to use as well. Um, other regulatory compliance, tax compliance and reporting, you know, this includes, this includes registering for your tax IDs um, properly, filing returns properly, paying various business taxes. You definitely don't want to um, want to pay attention to those. Um, you know, we've got industry specific regulations and that really depends on your field, but you may need to comply with regulations from bodies like the FDA, if you're in, um, you know, doing drugs, um, if you're um, in the drug development um, industry, uh, the FCC or the SEC, if you're in finance, um, the HHS, if you're in healthcare. Um, and the reason why I bring up these industry specific regulations is that we're living in a very interesting time legally. <laughs> um, uh, if you all didn't know, the um, Supreme Court recently just um, overturned a 40-year precedent called the Chevron defense. Um, and basically, it's a, the Chevron defense and the Chevron case basically says that if a law enacts a regulatory body that is responsible for the rulemaking, for um, giving you guidance on what you're supposed to do based on your industry. So for HIPAA, it's HHS. For um, the uh, uh, GLBA, which is the um, financial, which is um, a financial law, it's SEC and FINRA. Um, you know, these and regulatory bodies are um, are going to come to you and tell you this is what you have to do to comply with these laws, and we follow those. The, the Supreme Court just recently overturned that defense that said the regulatory bodies are actually not the last um, say in terms of guidance. Now the courts are. Um, and I think, you know, if you have seen that law, if you've already seen that news and you've seen like, oh, no, like, what does that mean? Do I not have to comply with these laws? Do I not? That's not the case. You still have to comply with these laws. But the questions on what counts as compliance you'll start to see that they'll um, start to get um, fought over very differently. You know, it won't be with the SEC coming knocking at the door. It might be a lawsuit instead. Um, and it's just something to keep in mind. It's something I can't, it's literally happened like two days ago. So we're all kind of in disarray with this um, recent thing, but don't let that deter you, that, that keep you from understanding what you need to do for compliance with the law that was enacted. Um, you still have those requirements. Um, business licenses and permits, you know, these vary by location and, uh, but often include like general business licenses, professional licenses, health and safety permits. You wanna make sure that you comply with um, exactly what you need to do. Okay, and our next one, Next one, funding, funding and securities laws. Um, you know, when it comes to funding your startup, there are several options, each with its own legal implications. Bootstrapping is one thing we call using personal funds or revenue to grow. This has the least legal complexity, but, you know, it, it can also limit growth because you're just kind of using your own um, savings or anything like that to, to build up your startup. Um, loans, they can come from banks, online lenders, or even friends and family. Be sure to properly document any loans, properly document any contracts with those loans, um, because uh, especially when, depending on the, even if it's not a high amount, when you're taking loans from regulated entities, from entities that exist for a while, um, not just your friends and family, if anything, I would say friends and family might be a little bit more complicated. Um, you wanna make sure that you're doing it from a legally sound way as well. Um, equity funding. Equity funding involves selling ownership stakes in your company. It's governed by securities law, what we call securities law, which is very complex and varies by jurisdiction. But just the idea of selling ownership stakes in your company, while a great way to help scale your business, to help um, bring in partners who can help you scale that business, make sure you're working with a lawyer to, one, properly sell your ownership stake and to make sure that you're following um, sec the security laws that um, the securities laws that you're subject to, right? Um, it's not just these equity finance folks that have to uh, 
um, because essentially when you bring on um, other owners into your business, right? They are your investors. What are you, what are your obligations when it comes to your investors? And you just have to make sure that you're following everything you need to. You need to understand and, you know, um, and just some things to, to kind of keep an eye out for and just to know about, you know, what's the difference between private and public offerings? Be aware of investor accreditation requirements, um, properly disclose risks to potential invest- investors. I think one big thing that is really important for, um, that's becoming an, a growing, growing concern for businesses, but also for um, investors is um, cyber breaches, you know, and it's my little bias that I am a specialist in this field, but uh, it's something that comes up too often, right? Um, now, especially if you're subject to the SEC, you're required by law to um, disclose any potential, uh, any type of cybersecurity incident to your investors. That might, and that comes from um, requirements from the SEC, but that also could be through contract, right? Like if you've created a contract with an investor, um, they might add those provisions in there as well. So look through those provisions to see what you need to make sure that you disclose so that it doesn't become a problem down the line. Um, and then comply with all applicable securities regulations. You know, um, Crowdfunding has become a popular option, but it just comes with its own set of regulations, right? Like research, you're going to have to really research platform specific rules um, and relevant laws before you launch a campaign, especially when you use a third party. What are you, you know, what are your requirements? What are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? Um, it's something to just keep in mind when you use a third party for crowdfunding. Okay, um, next one. All right, we have risk management and insurance. I mean, technically the entire presentation, if you could look at that and say it's all risk management, right? It's all pretty much risk management. We're trying to figure out how to make sure we're doing things um, in a uh, legally sound way so that we're not getting in trouble and we're managing our risk. Um, and effective risk management is crucial for protecting your business, right? We love the innovation, we want to promote innovation, and we want you to succeed, but we want you to do so making sure that you're protecting yourself. Um, and then you have to start by doing a little deep dive um, into your business model and start by identifying what those potential risks are to your business and then develop those strategies to mitigate them. Um, there are ways that you can mitigate risk like through contract. You can mitigate risk by not doing things by changing the way that you do things, right? Um, the other type of risk management that is prevalent is insurance, right? Um, general liability insurance, it protects against common business risks like customer injuries or property damage. Very important, especially if you have a physical location. Uh, professional liability insurance also can be known as errors and omissions insurance. This protects against claims of negligence or failing to perform your professional duties. It's something that if you provide a service, um, something that you want to look into for sure. Um, cyber insurance. So this is definitely when um, you have your separate entity, especially crucial in today's digital world, cyber insurance exists. And it is, um, it's a way for you to mitigate the risk for when a data breach occurs or a cyber attack happens. And I say when, because the rate at which companies, and especially startups and small business owners are experiencing cyber incidents is going through the, through the roof, right? It's, um, there was a statistic that I read actually, um, where I read that in 2025, there will be a cyber attack every two seconds, right? So if you can imagine, if there's a cyber attack every two seconds, it's not really that hard for cyber criminals to come after any company that exists, right? Because um, the mod with the development of technology, as we develop more, more advanced technology, so does the cyber criminal. And they're able to scale what they consider their business in being able to attack droves of folks, droves of different businesses and go through that. Um, uh, 
kind of uh, just attack a bunch of people at the same time, which is why cyber insurance has, is, exists. And it's really important. Uh, it's something that um, I try to push on um, startups as well, especially if you're heavily in the technology space or you heavily have a digital presence. Um, it not only helps you uh, protect from, it helps you mitigate the risks from the financial liability that you're going to have from data breaches, but it also gives you access to a specialized niche group of folks who know how to respond to cyber criminal activity, right? Um, and then some other things um, to look for other types of insurance, technology errors and omissions. Um, this is separate. It's a little bit more crucial for tech startups, um, especially those developing like um, different technology products, especially AI products, something that, you know, you'd want to consider, especially um, if that's your main um, source of business. Um, other insurances that come to mind are like in property insurance, um, workers comp, business interruption insurance. These are all different types of risk management tools that are available that you can take advantage of to help protect um, and mitigate your um, risk. Um, but just remember that insurance needs can vary greatly depending on your industry and location. So always, it's always important to consult with an insurance professional um, to determine the best coverage for your specific situation, especially when it's, um, it involves a lot of different, uh, it involves a more no novel approach to the business world, right? If you're doing something more on the innovative side, um, which is great, how you want to make sure you're working with an insurance professional to, to properly ensure that model. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. I think it's my last one. Yes. All right. So here's the last one, our exit strategies and M&A basics, right? Um, I know it might seem early to start talking about this or thinking about this, um, but it's important to think about your potential exit strategies from the start as well. Um, it's just all part of risk mitigation. It's all part of, you know, building that plan for yourself so that you're doing this with um, everything that you can to, to get the best results. Um, and you're doing it in the most legally sound way possible, right? Act, what is, but what the, do exit strategies look like? What are they um, called? Acquisition. Acquisition is selling your company to another business. A lot of contracts come into play when you're, about to sell your company into another business. It's not just a quick sign of a document and, and um, there you go, right? There's a lot of um, nuances that come into um, wanting to sell your business to uh, another business. A merger, combining your company with another, that takes a lot of due diligence on understanding, is this the company that I wanna merge with? If we're merging with another company, What's going to be split? Who's going to do what? How are we going to um, retain people? How are we going to share our IP that was previously um, protected? How do we share our business plans? What are we supposed to do with that? Um, a lot of thought and process goes into that as well. Um, if you're deciding to, um, this is less of a kind of an uh, exit strategy, not really, but you know, if you want to sell, if you want to do an initial public offering, um, it's where you can sell your shares to of your company to the public, um, understand the legal ramifications for that, and understand what you need to do um, from the legal side in order to uh, go that route. You know, um, and then management buyout is one as another exit strategy. It's where you can sell to the company's management team. Let's say you are um, in business with other folks you have co-founders, you want to get out of the company, you have, an, you have, an, uh, you have a way to just sell it to the existing uh, members or the existing management um, just to leave peacefully, but without um, disturbing the actual business or the business model, right? Um, so things like that we call like a management buyout. Um, each of these involves complex legal and financial considerations and the key areas to be aware of include due diligence processes, valuation methods, deal structures, um, and regulatory approvals. Depending on the type of business you have, sometimes you may need, and the, the scale at which you're at, and you know, how big you are, and how much attention you've gained from regulators, you might need regulator approval to even go through with either any of these exit strategies we just talked about. 
Um, but when the time comes, work closely with legal and financial advisors to navigate the complexities of that exit process. Um, and then one thing, you know, that I like to mention that, you know, sounds like a downer, but it's something to know that it's an avenue that exists and something to take advantage of. And that's bankruptcy. Um, if it turns out that your company is not doing well, if it's going um, the opposite way of what we'd all, you know, we don't want it to go, there are avenues to get out as well. And that's falls under the bankruptcy um, channel. And we want to make sure, and that's just something to know that um, it exists in the event that you need something to get out of. Um, you need something to get out when your um, product or your business is not doing well, but you're heavily encumbered by a lot of debt. Um, bankruptcy is a method to, it's a legal method that's there and exists for you to be able to um, pay off your debt easily, help, help you to sell the company and help you to um, kind of move on from that. Um, I think that's all I have for exit strategy. I think my next slide is my conclusion. Yes, all right, right. Not to end on a downer, right? Um, so we've covered a lot of ground today from business formation to exit strategies. You know, remember this is just an overview. Each of these topics are have way many more nuances and complexities, but the key takeaways are this, right? Legal considerations touch every aspect of your business. So start, don't think of legal as something you need to bring on later or think of legal as something you want to bring on, um, uh, you know, when you think, oh, now I'm big enough that I can have legal now. This is something you want to start with from the beginning. That's why there are a lot of attorneys like myself who call ourselves startup founders, because we want you to know that we work with startups. We work with small businesses on the regular because we want you to think of us as not just, um, you know, your your cost center or your your problem solver, we're your business partner as well here. We want to help you to scale your business. And that's kind of the whole reason why legal exists, right? Um, or lawyers exist. Um, laws and regulations can vary significantly by location and industry. Um, stay informed and proactive about legal matters um, that can prevent issues down the line. So I talked about a lot of new law that's coming up, like data privacy laws. Um, something to just keep in mind of, in mind of, because it's um, coming really fast and you don't want to fall behind on that. Um, and then regular, just having regular legal health checks, you know, are crucial as your business grows and evolves. So I've seen a lot of companies and clients where they start with legal from the beginning and then they completely just disappear thinking they don't need legal again. It's something you want to continuously compliance. It's something, it's not a done and you're done. You do it once and then you're done. It's something that you have to do continuously, especially as you scale, especially as you grow your business, just like you want to revisit your business model all the time to make sure it's working. Um, always bring in legal as well to make sure that it's working plus I'm doing it properly. Um, and, you know, I wanna encourage you to use this information as a starting point for further research and discussions. Um, and remember that investing in that proper legal guidance is an investment in the long-term success and the sustainability of your business. Okay, and that's all I have, I think. Um, forgot uh, what I put on the next slide here. Okay, yeah, there we go. I think there should be- So you say you think you, didn't, you had enough? <laughs> <laughs> I think right. there's a, a big gift for all of us who are either starting our own business or have already been in business and need to make sure that we have the conversation with the legal counsel as to all of the things that, um, um, that you mentioned. I, I want to make sure that if there are any particular questions from anyone in the audience that we give them the chance. Um, and then of course, a reminder that um, this, this is not legal advice. It's just an information forum for all of us. Fantastic. Maverick, thank you so much for that masterclass. That was really helpful. Foundational understanding, some of the tips and tricks that we need to in uh, make sure that we're paying attention to and incredibly helpful for our community. 
Uh, also, as Victor said, if anybody has questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Or if you would like to unmute, you can ask them um, directly. Uh, Maverick, I think, you know, I appreciate the insights that you shared. Um, I always ask folks if they paid attention to one or two things from this presentation, uh, what are the two most important things that you would want folks to really kind of zero in on as they're making sure that their legal vital is as healthy as possible? Sorry, was that a question for uh, yes. yeah, yeah. So you, can, you can tell us, you know, from from this session, obviously, there's a lot of really important highlights and really important things that we need to dive deep into it. But maybe one or two things that you're like, this is the most critical thing. If you can only do this, you know, as we're thinking about some of our founders that might be uh, early stage, this might just be the ideation component of it. You're like, please, yeah. please do these things to make sure that you are on the right track. Yeah, so definitely. Um, so the first one is don't think of legal as something that is out of your grasp. A lot of us attorneys recognize, especially, and there are attorneys that work with just startups, right? Like we just work with startups because we understand um, what it means to be a startup, right? Like my, my uh, myself, um, you know, as the founder and managing attorney of Avant-Garde Legal, that's my company, right? I started that myself. And I know what it means to start with, you know, like zero, like you're bootstrapping without any equity, anything like that. Um, but using, getting legal in, in the beginning is gonna help you so much down the road. And it's an investment, like I said. Um, and it's something that, you know, building a relationship with an attorney to not just think of them as something outside of your scope, but to think of them as your business partner, again, it's gonna help you so much down the line, you know, when it comes to um, your scaling capabilities, uh, legal is just something that we always wanna think about. So that's my first one, you know, like always think about that um, and pay attention to um, this new area of law, data, privacy, IP, Things that are usually not, um, uh, especially within a very technical world, um, it's something, yes, we need to focus on the basics for sure, but very quickly, these new laws are going to catch up to us and these new areas that you need to focus because you are not starting your business the way that people started their businesses 20 years ago, right? 10 years ago, not even three years ago, right? We are starting our businesses very, very differently with the use of technology that is also very, very different. I'm sure like if you were to start a company right now, you are probably going to get on Google Workspace or Microsoft Office or something um, that a major platform is going to offer you. And it's probably going to have an AI component already embedded in it, right? So it's already kind of coming here. And you want to make sure that you've also focused, um, you know, make sure you talk to lawyers who are, um, when you talk to lawyers and you want to build that relationship with them, make sure you're talking to someone that also understands that. There's this new area of law that we need to focus on, especially as me as a startup, because I'm not someone that has started 20 years ago, has like a brick and mortar shop starting, you know, um, uh, what's it called? Have like a specific model. And now I'm going into the virtual world. <clears throat> COVID actually really um, the biggest jump that we saw from a lot of businesses having to go digital was because of COVID, right? It's, it was um, a lot of businesses had to become more digital. There was just no question about it. Um, and now we live, you know, you just can't imagine yourself not being digital in this environment. Um, so just keep an eye out for, for those types of laws. Awesome, Maverick. I appreciate you making the comments, especially around the AI. I know I have a few uh, friends who are lawyers, folks that are in legal firms and spaces. And when, you know, AI and everything was coming out, they're like, oh, yeah, people keep showing up with their articles of incorporation that they downloaded from ChatGPT and they right. just can't get in there. And I think it's it's a helpful tool, but there are also people yes. like you who can say, hey, this is not 100% right. Let's put it together. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm also an AI governance professional. So, you know, I'm the first one that's going to tell you, like, if you don't use AI, yeah, you'll, 
you know, you don't want to be left out in the dust, right? Like you don't want to be left out when other people are using this technology to scale their businesses. Um, but again, there's always a way to do it to make sure that you're um, doing it properly, right? Um, and you're re mitigating your risk. Um, Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Well, fantabulous. Well, all we know it's going is that it's going to get more interesting as we continue to, to disclose all those data legalities in each of the states, countries, and continents. It should be interesting. So buckle up, everyone. That's why we have you, Maverick. So keep learning so you can tell us exactly what's going on. All right. Yeah, don't worry. Thank you again for uh, your participation on our Legal Vital today. Um, I am, I reminded you already of the eight to the fifth power, but I'm going to go right here real quick uh, to where we are on the holistic approach to your business well-being and making sure that your company's health is where it needs to be. So we already went through well-being well -being and finance. Uh, now we just went through legal. Uh, coming up is marketing and a strategy. And then we'll have a, a time where we'll, all of us will come together so you can um, ask us specific questions that um, are related to your business, all right? So um, um, schedule yourselves for July 20. Coming up with the marketing of Vital. Um, you'll get the reminder from Star Out, of course. And then August 13 um, for the strategy. And then the Entrepreneurial Summit, a closing of the program is going to be September 10, right before the awards. And with that, I just want to say thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give you an extra 17 minutes of your day and time so you can spend quality time with your friends and family. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everybody.